believe that the church came to us in four stages. And as I think about the church today in our world, if you were to walk up to an individual and you were at to ask them, what is the church? What would they tell you? The answers would vary from individual to individual. Because there would be those, unfortunately, even in the church, that would answer, well, the church, it's a building. Brethren, the church is not this building. The church is those of us who are assembled together in this building. We as individuals make up the Lord's church. Or you may hear someone say, well, you know, the church, it is a certain denomination of which there are many. And those collective denominations are the ones who make up the church. But brethren, when we think of what the church is, the only way that we can come with the proper concept to establish what the church is, is to turn to Scripture. Right. You remember Paul as he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17, where he tells us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And he tells us what it is profitable for. At the end of that verse he says, It is so that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work, so all that we need to know, all the information that we need to know about the church will come from the inspired Word of God. Or maybe that's not enough for you and you can go to 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 3. And there our brother writes to us that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What does he mean that he's given us all things Brethren, everything that we need to know about how to live on this earth, how to prepare ourselves for the life after, and how that we're going to live in the afterlife in eternity can be found within the contents of God's holy word. Mm -hmm. And brethren, if anyone else comes up to you and they say that that concept is not right, I would remind them of what our brother Paul wrote to our brethren in Galatia, <coughs> chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 9 where he emphasizes twice in two verses, if anyone comes to you and preaches anything other than what we have preached, he says, let him be accursed. He says twice. Not just one verse, but he mentions it in two consecutive verses. And so we need to understand something. If someone comes and says, you can find the concept of the church without looking at Scripture, they are in error. Mm -hmm. They are not teaching the truth. Amen. And so I want us this morning to look at the church as it comes from its very thought in God's mind to unfortunately where the church is today. And there's four stages. Number one, there is the planning stage. And as I think about the planning stage, God before the world was ever formed, put a plan in motion that would bring all nations to Him in the church. Go to the book of Ephesians and begin reading there in chapter 1 and start in verse, uh, verse 4. And I'll read all these verses because I think it is there. It is important for us to see what the Bible says so that we'll have the right understanding. It says, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. In other words, Paul says He chose us in Christ before the first thing was ever created. Before the first verse of Genesis could ever take place, He chose us through Christ. That we should be holy without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in us. 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Brethren, God, before the foundation of the world, predestined, predetermined a plan by which we might be saved. Yeah. Now, that is a biblical definition of predestination. I know the world offers us a false concept of predestination. Yeah. They say it applies to specific or certain individuals. The Bible says that God predestined all of His created mankind to be united in Christ. Right. He set forth a plan which the church, or by which the church, was to be established. Or perhaps we just need to turn over one chapter to chapter 2 and verse 16. And notice it says that He wants to bring us together in one body. Verse 16 says, and that He might reconcile them both. He's referring to the Jews and the Gentiles. That He might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. God wants us to be saved. That was His plan. That's the plan from the very beginning of time. And you see, the church is done according to God's eternal purpose, which we have already read about. And you can continue to read about that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 through verse 11. So we know that God had a plan. But that plan, secondly, had to go to what I call the preparatory or the preparation stage. And as I think about the preparatory stage, how was mankind prepared? How did they come to this knowledge of what was to be expected? Well, God didn't leave that to chance either. He spoke to the prophets of old, especially in Isaiah in the book of Daniel. If you go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and verse 3, notice what he says. It says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the, all, above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Isaiah says the Lord sent His prophets to lay to begin the preparation. And He tells us where it's going to come from. But then if you go over to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, Daniel is even made a little more specific. It says, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Amen. Was that not something also, secondly, as we think about this preparatory stage? Is that not something that John the Immerser and Jesus also preach? You remember, if you go to Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through verse 3, John's message was to repent for the kingdom is at hand. And then if you just go to the very next chapter in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, and you look at verse 17, Jesus continued that same message as he says, repent for the kingdom is at hand. What John and what Jesus were saying is you remember that the prophets said that the kingdom was going to be established. John and Jesus says, now is the time they were speaking of. Now I'll give you this extra this morning. I won't charge you anything because it just came to my mind. But if you go to John chapter 4, you remember Jesus was passing through Samaria. And he ran into this woman at a well. And he told the woman there at the well to get him, get him something to drink, correct? And the woman looked because she knew that he was a Jew and she was very puzzled at what he had said. And she says, how really is it that you, a Jew, would even speak to me a Samaritan? And then they began a discussion. 
And the discussion centered around worship, didn't it? Jesus told the woman at the well of Samaria that while today we all may worship in, in one place here or there, you worship here in the mountains and the Jews, they worship in Jerusalem. Jesus says there's a time coming where that's not going to be true. He's talking about the church being established, brethren. He's talking about that to which you and I can be a member of. You see, Jesus, when He asked the question in Matthew chapter 16 to the apostles that were there, He says, well, who do men say that I am? And remember the response was, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus became very specific. And He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter, the vocal one of the group, spoke up. And he said what? That you are Jesus, the Son of the living God. Mm -hmm. And Jesus replied to him, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, but my Father. And he says, upon this rock, on your confession of who I am, he says, I will build my church. The church is in the preparatory stage as Jesus is telling them that I'm going to establish the church. And brethren, we sang about it in the song. Did, did our song before the lesson not really cover everything we're going to talk about this morning? You'll see that it did. But Jesus paid the price, did he not? In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, as he's right, as Paul is speaking and sending a letter to the Ephesian elders, he said, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of the church, which Christ purchased with His own blood. Jesus purchased the church. It was all done in preparation for you and me today and for those who have lived before us since the cross. But thirdly this morning, there is the state and the stage in the church which I would refer to as the perfected stage. And when I talk about the perfected stage, what I'm speaking of is the time when the church came into existence. In Acts chapter 2, and I'm not going to read all of Acts chapter 2 to you, okay? But we know that there were those who were gathered together and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended upon them in the form of cloven tongues. And Peter and the others began to speak so that every man would understand in his own language. And he preached unto them the first gospel sermon where he appealed to the great prophet Joel, the great King David. And he told those folks on that day, the very one that you put to death is the one who came to save you from your sins. You murdered him. And we know that those that were there that day that had a good, that had an honest heart, it says that they were pricked in the heart, they were cut to the heart, and they asked a question when they realized the error they were in. What must, what must I do? What must we do? And the answer was given. That they needed to repent, to be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that their sins would be washed away. Brethren, the church was ushered in and was perfected on the day of Pentecost. As we read down through the rest of that chapter, we will read in about 3,000 were immersed that day. 3,000. What a number that were added to the church the very first day. But when we think of the church that was established on the day of Pentecost, let's understand something. That church is referred to in what I see as three ways in the Scripture. Now some people will say, well, it's only really two ways, but I want you to consider the third. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and verse 23, the church there is referred to as a universal body. Meaning that it doesn't matter if you're here, if you're in Thailand, if you're in Cambodia, or you're wherever you are, if you have obeyed the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, you are part of the church universally. And that's why when we think about what when we go somewhere or we run into somebody, 
They find out that we're a member of the church and they're a member of the church. And they'll say, small world. No, it's a big family. That's the church universally. But the church is also referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, and not only in that passage. But let me back up a minute. I'll give you another example of the universal church while my mind's on it. If you go to the book of Galatians, as Paul begins the book, as he begins that letter, it says it is to the churches of Galatia. Multiple congregations, yet one church. Or how about Jesus Himself in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3? Did He not also there speak to individual congregations, but they were part of the universal church? But then in 1 Corinthians and even other letters that Paul wrote, he says, to the church at Corinth, to the church at Philippi. So there are these local congregations. By the way, that's what we are. We are a local congregation of God's people that are part of the church universally. But then if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 18, Paul also refers to the church in the third way that I see, and that is the assembly. That we are the assembly of God's people. And someone might technically say, well, Brother Ray, isn't that the same as the local church? Well, I guess you could say that. But, brother, remember, Jesus says two or three can come together and they can worship. They can be the church. Amen. So, you know, it's not limited to a congregation. This fellowship as the church can take place in other ways. And we know from Scripture that the early church Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. It says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The early church had the same doctrine. Mm -hmm. They did not vary. They did not deviate from what the apostles taught. And that's why Paul in Galatians that we mentioned a while ago, that's why he says if someone else brings you another gospel which is not another, let him be a curse. And brethren, the same should be true today. If we're not teaching and preaching the apostles' doctrine, let that man be a curse. Yeah. Right. Let him face those consequences that are coming. Or perhaps we need to go and we need to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. Notice what Paul says. He says, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son of the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach ev everywhere in every church. You see what Paul said? Paul says, I'm going to teach the same thing that was revealed and taught to me. He says, that's what I, my responsibility is. Mm -hmm. Or we could go back to Acts chapter 14 in verse 23. Brethren, they had the same organization. They were organized in the exact same way in every congregation. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, it says, So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Mm -hmm. Same doctrine, same organization, everywhere throughout the known world at that time. But I'm sad to report that the church, even its perfected stage, I'm sad to turn to Acts chapter 20. I'm sad to go there and read from verse 28 down through verse 31. Because exactly what is stated here will ultimately bring us to our fourth stage this morning. Also, Luke records, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For this I know. It is a fact. He says, I know what's going to happen. He says that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, 
Also from among you men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples unto themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. I wish it weren't true. I, I wish what, what was written on the pages of Scripture, I wish that was one place that the Bible was not true. But it is. And that brings us to our fourth stage. And that is the perverted stage. As I think about the perverted stage, it all began with one change that led to another change, which led to another change, which has led to multiple changes. Brethren, when I think of the perverted stage, I don't remember the latest number, but I believe the last I heard was there are over 8,000, and it may be more than that, maybe it was 18,000. It doesn't matter whether it's 8,000 or 18,000, it's a whole lot more than the Bible describes. And out of all of those religious organizations, they claim to be the church. I challenge you. I challenge you. Find the doctrines that they're teaching in God's Word. Okay? And as long as we stand by the Word of God, we will not be in the perverted stage. But unfortunately, men's ears became itchy, scratchy. They wanted to be taught by fables and by other things. Yep. And that led to a falling away. The perverted stage. Oh, but wait a minute. I would be remiss. I mentioned some eight or how many ever thousand different ones. Unfortunately, there are those who were once faithful congregations of the Lord's church, the one you read of in Scripture, who have fallen away. Amen. And they've turned to the fables and the wisdom of men rather than the Word of God. That's right. They've adopted the worldly mindset. There are many in the church today who are more worried about numbers, physical numbers, bodies in the pews, than they are worried about the spiritual growth and development of the ones who are there. That's right. And that's the worldly mindset. Yep. And so I'm going to throw up a chart. And it's a two-page chart. And I guess it would be appropriate for me to mention this at this point. I know that I've talked about this particular <laughs> document that I have in my hand right now. If you're here and you're not a member of the body of Christ, the church of Christ, I implore you this morning to take one. I printed about 15 of these. It's a tract that's entitled The One True Church, The Marks That Matter. Amen. And it will point you to the truth. Yeah. I, I, I was hoping that my family didn't see that there are seven pages of things here. I said so they would have freaked out if they thought they were going to preach seven pages today. I'd have to break this down into probably about 15 lessons to cover everything. It is full of what the scripture says about the Lord's church. When I look at this chart and I see on the chart that's there when you think about the major, quote, major religions of the world, the very first one came about in about 606 A.D. That's known as the Roman Catholic Church, which, by the way, the Roman Catholic Church evolved out of emperor worship in the early first century. Then, everyone that follows the Catholic Church, every one of those is where somebody got mad at something that was going on in the Catholic Church. And so they developed these other, other thoughts and mindsets of their what they thought the religion was. The Lutheran Church came out of Germany. The Episcopalian Church in England. The Presbyterian Church in Switzerland. I have a copy. If you want a copy of that chart, I'll be happy to share it with you. But if you go back and you study in depth the history of denominationalism, you will see that it was a departure that came. 
And each and every one, because some brother got mad at another brother, so they decided, well, we don't like the way they're doing it, we're going to change and do it our way. Right. And brethren, understand something this morning. The problems that exist in the Lord's church today are not problems that exist because of doctrine. The majority of the problems that exist in the church are problems with personalities. Amen. Because brethren cannot get along in biblical unity. Yes. The church is in four stages, folks. It was planned. Let me start over. It was planned for. It was prepared for. It was brought to perfection by Jesus Christ as He hung on the cross. And then it was perverted by well-intended intentions of men who thought they could improve. I hope you caught that. Well-intentioned that they could improve on what God had given. Brother, there's no improvement on what God says. Amen. Because when God says it, we need to believe it. And that settles the whole matter. Right. This morning, we may have one who is not a member of the body of Christ, the church of Christ, the one in which he purchased with his own blood. My prayer is that I've said something this morning or in past lessons, if you've been coming, that has pricked your heart and has caused you to see the need that you have to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you've heard those words spoken, then you have developed a faith in that word, and then you have the desire to change, to repent, leave the way of the world, begin to live the way that God wants you to live. Amen. Confessing the name of Jesus as the one who gave his life so that you could be saved and appropriate his blood in that watery grave of baptism where your sins will be washed away. And as you come up out of that water that you'll be able to walk in a newness of life. Or have you done that this morning? If you've left the way of truth, Go back one slide. Maybe. You're in. Your life is in the perverted stage. And as long as you're in the perverted stage, you're outside of Christ. We implore you this morning to come back to the perfected stage because it is the perfected stage in which we will be presented a glorious body at the end of time. This morning you can come repenting of sin and confessing those sins. Will you let your brethren pray with you, pray for you? I hope you will. I pray that you will. You see, as our brother, good brother Kenny says, give man your hand, give God your heart. Amen. That's what we're asking this morning. We want you, if you have a need, to make your need known by stepping out of your comfort zone that pew. Walk to the front. Let us know how we can assist you. And we'll do what we can do as your brethren to get you from this earthly land to the heavenly land. <coughs> Brother John's going to come. He's going to lead us in a song. We're going to stand and make it convenient for you to step out. Won't you do that right now? Always thank you. Always thank you.